How do you respond to the needs of those around you? The people with whom you live, work, and play. When you come face to face with need, how, how, what is your natural response? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my family and I, we took a trip down to Disneyland, LA. It was awesome. We had a great time, but it was culture shock because you are inundated. We were inundated with need on every street corner. Signs saying, I need food, I need water, I need shelter, I need work. And there were people sleeping on the sidewalks and, and it was just like, it was almost like culture shock. And on the way home, we had a 14 hour drive home. We kind of broke it into two legs. The second leg of seven hours, we're tired. We've been traveling. We had a crazy busy week of fun, but we're tired, right? We've got another four hours ahead of us to get on the, the last leg of our journey home. And we stop off at a gas station to gas up and get some refreshments. And I go around back at the gas station where the restrooms were and I see a guy laying on the concrete asleep in the baking sun and it doesn't look like he's breathing. And here's what my initial response was. I was face to face with real need. And my initial fleshly response was, I don't have time for this. I mean, I'm not proud of that, but I'm just being honest. That was my initial response. I, I don't have time for this. If the police have to get involved and I have to get, and so that was my initial kind of momentary response. And I was like, no, this guy has real legitimate need. I've got to do something. So I ran to my car, grabbed my phone. My wife came back with me. I'm ready to call 911. And I come back in a tizzy and I'm like yelling at the guy, are you okay? And he kind of startles awake. <laughs> I think I terrified him. And he kind of mumbled something. I don't know what he said. But I was like, it's very hot out here. You're drenched. Can I get you some water? And I went inside. I got him some water. I came back. And I'm like, you might want to move your spot. Uh, I don't think it's healthy for you to just sit here in the sun and bake. But I was face to face with real need. And honestly, my initial response was to just ignore it. Now, I didn't land there, thank, thank Jesus. But, but my initial response was to just, this is too much to handle. I don't have time for this. We got a four hour trip ahead of us. Let's just forget about this. How do you respond when you come face to face with needs? Today, we're going to see Jesus coming face to face with needs. Again, we've seen this over and over and over again in his ministry, right? He comes face to face with needs. And I want you to pay close attention to how Jesus interacts with needy, sinful people and, and what his response is to their needs in the midst of that, okay? So a little bit of background from where we've been. Uh, we've been following the ministry of Jesus. Two weeks ago, Jesus sent his guys out, the 12 apostles. He sent them out and sent them on a short-term missions trip. And they go across the region. They're telling people about the kingdom of God. They're t- calling people to repentance. Signs and wonders are accompanying them. And that was two weeks ago. Last week, we had really interesting passage that Drew taught on. It was kind of an aside from the story we've been following so far where Mark tells us about John the Baptist's death. And John died because he speaks out against Herod and his wife Herodias's marriage because Herodias was his niece as well. Herod's family tree is all kind of messed up, okay? And so John speaks out against that and they kill him, they behead him. And then today we're gonna pick up as the disciples return from that short-term mission trip, what happened? So Mark chapter six, starting in verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. I think this is a moment of just pure excitement. When we were at Disneyland, every time we got off a ride, both of my youngest were on either side of me holding my hands. And they're just like, dad, that was amazing. There's yelling in my ear holes, right? Dad, that was amazing. You can't, did you see the dragon in the fire? And there was a big boulder and it was going to drop on us. But at the last moment we ducked under in the waterfall and the d- big drop on the ride. And they're just so excited about every ride. I think that's what this moment when the disciples returned to Jesus and they're, they're like, Jesus, it was amazing. Demons fled. The sick were healed. People were answering the call to repentance and embracing our message. It was incredible because there's nothing like experiencing God working in and through you to affect the lives of others. And so they come back. Surely they're exhausted. They're probably just functioning on adrenaline at this point, but they're telling him about everything that's happened. 
And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. Now you'd think in this moment when Jesus is, his ministry influence is growing and growing, the disciples just spread the news of the kingdom. There's lots of momentum that that Jesus might lead his people to monopolize on this moment, right? Like let's hold a huge ministry event. Let's have a crusade or like an old school tent revival or have some sort of big ministry event. That's not what his, where he leads his disciples to. Look what he says. Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. Jesus intentionally leads them to rest well on the other side of serving well. Here's what I want us to pull out of this. Rest is vital. It's vital. Jesus led his disciples to do it. Jesus lived this out as well. We'll see that here in a few moments. But rest is vital. It's crucial for fruitful ministry because it's crucial for fruitful ministers. Try to say that 10 times fast. That's a mouthful. But rest is crucial for fruitful ministry because it's vital for fruitful ministers, okay? And Jesus, he leads his disciples to go into the season of rest. Look at it again here. Come away by yourselves. This means they're going to leave the people they've been serving. They're going to leave the needs there. They're going to leave the ministry responsibilities behind and they're going to go away. They're not bringing the people they've been serving. They're going away by themselves, away from the noise and the responsibilities and the work. And they're going to be by themselves to a desolate place. Now we don't use that word often anymore, but that means a lonely place. Often we see Jesus going to a desolate or lonely or the wilderness or up on a mountainside. So they're going away from their natural context. And the whole purpose of this is rest. Now this is not Jesus just saying, hey, you guys are hangry and being rude. Go take a nap. This is Jesus leading them to rest. The the idea behind rest all throughout scripture is to restore. Jesus is leading them to a place of restoration, mind, body, and spirit. This isn't just go take a nap. This is restoration of mind, body, and spirit. He leads them to a place to do that. And And it says for the reason why, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to even eat. Can you imagine going on a missions trip and you just don't get to eat because there's so many people you're serving? Like those of you who have been to Mexico, right? Are you not grateful for the delicious Mexican food there, right? But they're they're on this short-term missions trip and they come back and they haven't had leisure to even eat because they've been serving so many people. And Jesus leads them away from all of the noise, away from all of the ministry to restore mind, body, and spirit, to restore. And then Mark, he kind of triples down on this idea. And they went away, they left their context in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. So Jesus is leading them to a place of peace and rest where they will be They will receive from God. They will receive from God and not be pouring out, not be giving to others, not be meeting needs, but they're going away from all of that to receive from God, to be filled up so that they might function and serve from the overflow, not a deficit. We are not created to live in exhaustion. We are created to live from the overflow. And one of the ways we can do that is by having spaces in our lives, like Jesus leads his disciples to, where we have restoration, where we go away and be restored, mind, body, and spirit by the Lord to receive from him. So here's my question for us to wrestle with. Do you have rhythms of rest in your own life? Here we see Jesus lead them into this place of silence and solitude. Do you have rhythms in your life where you have a space to go away from the responsibilities, the noise, the kids, the spouse, the work, whatever it is, to be restored in silence and solitude with the Lord? Do you have rhythms of that in your life? This is so important. And here's one of the reasons why. If we don't rest and restore like Jesus is talking about, we will look for rest in other places. 
And that can be as seemingly innocuous as uh, doom scrolling Instagram or binging Netflix. Those things seem uh, uh, unharmful. They actually are harmful. Or it can be as ugly as pornography and alcoholism. But if we're not taking moments to rest and restore and delight in the work that Jesus has done for us, rest our physical body, if we're not taking those moments in silence and solitude away from the noise, we will look for that rest elsewhere. And so do you have rhythms of rest? And if you're like, I don't even know where to start, silence and solitude, how do I do that? I'd encourage you, start wherever you can. Start maybe at five minutes. Start this week, have a, a five minute span where you're, it's just you and Jesus. There's no noise, there's no kids, there's no responsibility. Maybe you're out in creation or in a favorite spot in your house where you can get some peace and quiet and just be with the Lord and just not to, 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 to do anything or just to receive from him. God, is there anything you want to say to me in this moment? Is there anything that you want me to be aware of or notice in my life or in the, the, the beautiful scenery around me? to receive from him. And if five minutes is too much, start with one minute. This is probably a weak muscle for most of us, myself included. But start. Have some space this week where you can go away in silence and solitude to be restored by the Lord. And as you get comfortable with one minute or five minutes or wherever you start, try and up it a little bit but make this a rhythm of your life. Talk about this in your marriage or in your parenting. How can we incorporate this in our home? Or if you don't have a family, how can you in your busy life, how can you integrate this idea of silence and solitude? It is so crucial for your ministry. And I do want all of us to view ourselves as ministers. A minister is not just some a title that you achieve at some point if you work at a church. A minister, this literally means somebody who serves in the gospel. You're a minister. I'm a minister. And if we want our ministries to be effective in our homes and our workplaces where we live, work, and play, we have to take rest seriously. You serve well, yes. You also rest well. So are, do you have rather, rhythms of rest in your life. So Jesus, he's leading his disciples to to this rhythm of rest. We're going to go away in silence and solitude, but a problem arises. Of course it does, right? Verse 32, and they went away into the boat to a desolate place by themselves. So you can imagine they're in the boat. Some of them are dreary eyed. Maybe some of them are starting to like nod off, go to sleep, right? Now many saw them going and recognized them. So the The townspeople see them leaving and they don't just recognize Jesus anymore. It says they recognize them. They're starting to recognize the disciples because the disciples just went on this missionary trip and word is spreading about what Jesus and his disciples are bringing. And so they recognize them and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. This looks like chaos to me. They're just like, everybody's running to where Jesus is, like crazed boy band fans or something, you know, like just everybody's there. And They're running there from on foot. In verse 34, when he went ashore and saw a great crowd. Now let's just think about the crowds that Jesus interacted with. Why did people come to Jesus? Because they were sick, they were diseased, they had some sort of ailment, or they were demonically influenced. So look out at this crowd with Jesus and his his disciples as they're stepping off the boat. You're looking at people who have lesions and sores. You're looking at people who are being carried on stretchers because they can't walk for themselves. You're looking at people who look like they are out of their minds because of demonic possession. You're maybe even looking at people like the demoniac that we saw a couple chapters ago who was naked, bloodied, and scarred up because demons had caused him to, to hurt himself. You're looking at a sickly, bound and sin-riddled crowd. If I'm standing there in the boat, I'm going to look at these needs and just think, man, this is too much. A great crowd with this much need? Look at what Jesus says. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. He looks at these people who have so much need And he has compassion on them. And the word in the original language here for compassion, it's an awesome word. 
It's splagnizomai. Is that not awesome? Let's say that together. Splagnizomai. And it means your bowels, which is weird, right? Because bowels do weird stuff. But in the, in the first century Jewish, Jewish culture, they believed that the bowels were the seat of love and, and pity and compassion. And so it, it, that's where we get our phrase that that was gut-wrenching, right? Splagnizomai. Jesus looks out and he's moved in his bowels. He's moved in the deepest part of him with compassion compassion for these people. This compassion that wells up into action. And it tells us why. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He looks out at this sickly crowd and he doesn't see a problem to be managed. He sees a people to be loved. People who are like sheep without a shepherd, who need to be nurtured and cared for and protected and provided. And this is Jesus, the good shepherd, responding accordingly to these sickly oppressed, bound sheep. And look at what he does first. And he began to teach them many things. Now in church, if you've been in church culture, you've probably heard the idea of you, people who have the gift of shepherding. And it's often talked about that those people are people who have the ability to maintain and nurture deep, authentic relationships, which is it's true. But here, Jesus, the good shepherd, He looks out and he sees these sheep who need a shepherd. What's the first thing he does? He teaches them. Teaching is a big part of the shepherding ministry. And here he began to teach them many things. Again, Mark elevates Jesus teaching many ministry more than any other gospel. And Jesus is teaching them. He's nourishing their mind and spirit with truth. He's tending to the real physical deep needs in their life. He's come face to face with them, probably many of them sickly, but he doesn't immediately start healing. What he does is he provides nourishment for their mind and spirit by preaching truth to them. Verse 35, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. So the disciples are like, Jesus, this is a great sermon, but you've been preaching all day, buddy. You've been preaching all day. We're tired. They're tired. There's no food out here. This is a desolate place. No resources. Send them away. Now, remember, let's give the disciples a break, right? They just, on the heels of a short-term missionary trip, tiring. They didn't even get to eat on that thing. Then they're about to go rest. And all of a sudden this massive crowd shows up. We're going to find out here in a few moments that 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Some commentators say this crowd might've been as big as 20,000 people. Okay. And they've been serving these people all day. Jesus has been teaching and now they're exhausted and they're out of resources. And they say, send them away. This is a humanitarian crisis, Jesus. We don't have the resources to to provide for these people. And look at what Jesus says to them, verse 37. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. What? <laughs> what do you mean, Jesus? We're out here in the middle of nowhere. I don't, I don't know if you thought I had bread on me, but I don't. Like, what are we going to do? Look at their response. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? A denarius was about a day's wages in that time. And so 200 denarii is 200 days worth of work and wages. And, the, and I, I believe it's the gospel of Matthew that has this uh, an addition to this statement here where they said, even if we bought that much bread, everybody would get but a small morsel of it. It wouldn't satisfy them. And so they, Jesus challenges them. And it's interesting that he asks them to feed them himself, themselves Um, But think about what the disciples have experienced. They just experienced the miraculous happening on this mission trip. They saw God working in and through them to affect the lives of others around them. They saw miracles happening as a result of the ministry they were a part of. But in this moment, they don't have space for a miracle. They see a big problem and they're thinking, send them away. We can't handle this problem. We can't meet their need. But Jesus has different plans. Verse 38, he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. I think this is a frantic search among the thousands of people there. Does anybody have food? We got a problem here. And when they had found out, they said five and two fish. Then he commanded them to sit down 
in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. Now, I think as Jesus is praying, the disciples, you know, you're, you're, they teach you in Sunday school to close your eyes when you're praying, right? But I think the disciples, like one eye open, like what does he think he's going to do with five loaves and two fish? How is he going to feed us all? And he begins to multiply this sack lunch that was provided. And they all ate and were satisfied. This is that post-Thanksgiving dinner, tryptophan-induced, belt-unbuckling type of satisfaction. This is everybody's ready for a good long nap in this moment. They were all satisfied. Verse 43, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. There's leftovers for the fridge. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Again, not including women and children. This could have been between 15 and 20,000 people. This is truly a profound miracle that the disciples got to experience. But what I want us to see more than just the miracle that happened is the heart of, the, of our Savior. Look at the Jesus ministered with compassion. Let's look at it again. When he went ashore and he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. That splagnizo my, I love saying that word, that, that gut-wrenching compassion that compels him out of his love to act. This isn't just seeing a need and be like, oh, that's really a bummer for you, but it's a desire to act as well because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them. Jesus begins to tend to their ap- actual deepest need, their spiritual needs. He's nourishing their mind and spirit with truth. That's where he begins, but he doesn't stop there. Yes, he tends to their spiritual needs, but they have legitimate, real, physical need right in front of them. They need food. And so Jesus provides a meal. Verse 42 says, and they all ate and were satisfied. Jesus is compelled as he looks at these people who have great needs, both spiritual and physical, to meet them. Do, this, this is the heart of our God. Jesus is a God who is compassionate. His love compels him to meet needs. Do you believe that about our God? Do you believe our God who looks, our God is a God who, who looks out at a crowd of sickly, possibly demon possessed people and is compelled to love them by teaching and nourishing them. That's who our God is. Do you believe that about our God? Do you believe that's his response to your sin is in compassion? He wants to meet your deepest needs. That's what Jesus did in this story. And that's what he did throughout his whole ministry. It's epitomized on the cross. The cross is the place where the compassionate love of Christ meets our deepest need, our sin to be dealt with. And I hope and I pray that the gospel and the truths therein never become trite phrases that we know and then we think we need to move on to something deeper. There is nothing deeper. The gospel is the whole shebang. The gospel is, you don't outgrow the gospel. The gospel is how you grow. And so he's providing for their needs and he did this for us on the cross. That Jesus, he who knew no sin, perfect, holy, righteous, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. That is that Jesus marched resiliently towards the cross, enduring scorn, shame, public humiliation, beatings, being stripped naked, and then ultimately crucified. And then he took the wrath of God on our behalf. All of God's wrath towards our sin was poured out on Jesus. And he took every last drop. And then he died as the perfect once for all sacrifice for our sins. This is compassionate love meeting our deep need. The deepest need of your life, the deepest need of my life is that our sin gets dealt with once and for all because sin is the only thing that separates us from God. And so Jesus, he 
dealt with sin once for all on the cross. And three days later, he rose from the grave, defeating sin, uh, which is our greatest enemy, defeating Satan, another great enemy, and defeating the grave and confirming who he said he was all along. Jesus is the one who meets us in our deep need. His compassion compels him to do so. And as people who have experienced the compassionate love of Jesus, we now get to extend that into our sphere of influence. As we've experienced it, we can extend it. So, do you have compassion for the needs around you? I was wrestling with this just a couple weeks ago in a leadership retreat. I was uh, evaluating the needs in my relationships, my marriage, my parenting, my friend circles. And the leaders of this retreat, one of them's name's Tara, she said, I want you to go out into the woods and you have about an hour to pray. And I just want you to think about what needs are present in these relationships that you're not aware of. And so I went out and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the beautiful creation. I said, God, help me to see the needs that I don't see in my marriage and in my home the two places that I really wanted to focus on. And almost immediately, two phrases came to mind that my family has been saying that I misunderstood. One of them, my wife has been saying, we've been doing such a good job of doing one-on-one time with the kids, but I miss going on dates with you. And the Lord brought that to my mind. I was, oh my goodness, I totally misunderstood. I thought she said, we are crushing it with the kids. I thought that was the emphasis. But the emphasis is, no, I want to go on dates with you. Duh, husband, like dates your wife, right? But I missed it. A need in my own marriage. I missed it. The other thing was my daughter has been, she'll come up to me and I can't, I sound like a d- total idiot when I say it, but she sounds cute when she says it. Um, she'll come up to me and she'll say, daddy, what you doing? I kind of sound like the Swedish chef or something, <laughs> but um but she, I, I thought she just wants to know what I'm doing. I'm mowing the lawn. I'm doing this project. I'm making dinner. I'm playing this game, whatever. But she doesn't want information. She wants relationship. And I missed it. I thought she wanted just to know about what I'm doing. But she wants to be invited into that with me. And so to meet those needs with compassion, I had to make some changes. I came home and told my wife, we need to plan some dates. We're going on one this Saturday. It's awesome. Um, I've told my daughter, I want to invite you into those spaces with me. Help me to see that in the future. And so do you see the needs around you? Maybe even in your own home. And do you respond to them with compassion? It's, it's sometimes easy to see a need and say, oh, that's too much for me to handle. So do you respond to them with compassion like Jesus does for you in your deepest need? Your sin being dealt with once for all. So Jesus, he's fed and everybody's been taken care of. And now the ministry event is coming to a close. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after that, or after he had taken leave of them, he went up on a mountain to pray. Now I want you to see here, Jesus didn't just lead other people into silence and solitude. It was a part of his life as well. He's up on the mountainside, silence and solitude, alone being receiving from his father. So he goes up there and when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. These disciples cannot catch a break exhausting missionary endeavor. And then they come back and they serve people all day. Now they're getting in the boat to find a place of rest and the wind's against them. Like this is exhausting, right? I'm sure there's some bickering going on right here, like kids in the back seat of their parents' car, right? Like their tensions are high in the boat. And, and uh, the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, which is 3 a.m., they've been doing this for a long time. Fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now this is a cool thing Jesus can do. He's walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought he was a, they thought it was a ghost. So Jesus, remember, he's in this silence and solitude moment. He was up on the mountain and he's walking on the waves. Apparently those are the only two places people won't flock around him because no one else knows how to walk on water. And so he's doing this moment of silence and solitude. He was going to walk past the disciples and, but they're, they are terrified because they think he's a ghost. And there was a superstition of the day that if you saw an apparition walking on the waves, it was an omen of death. It was a a fisherman's superstition. So at least four of these guys who have background in fishing are terrified. And so uh, they cried out, 
For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them. And the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Now, there's a lot in this last little piece here. What does it have to do with the loaves and him walking on water? Why is their hearts hardened? What does this all mean? Um, And there's really two types of interpretations. I highly encourage you to go study these things for yourself if this is not already your practice. One interpretation is that uh, the disciples have weighed the evidence. Jesus has claimed to be God. They've seen evidence of that. They've weighed the evidence and rejected that. They've rejected the truth that Jesus is God, the hardening of their heart, almost like the story of Pharaoh in the Old Testament. Uh, The other interpretation, which is the one I tend towards, is that the disciples are slow to perceive who Jesus is. They've seen him do miracles. They've heard him claim to be God but yet there's some wrestling and some doubting. And I don't think the other interpretation is accurate because the disciples don't seem to outright reject Jesus. In fact, they're, they're following him. They're going on missionary endeavors with him. I think they're just wrestling with who is this God? The one who can walk on water, controls the weather, the one who multiplies loaves and fishes. Who is this guy? Okay, so um, they're wrestling. It says they're, they have hardened hearts, when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people to on their beds. Can you just imagine this moment? Just like everybody running with a, with a bed behind them, like from all over the region, bringing people to Jesus, uh, to wherever he, they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might even might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Here's what I want us to pull out of this. The world longs for Jesus. Like, look at it here. They see him. They recognize him. And what happens? Everybody is running about the whole region to bring their sickly and their, their people who are diseased to Jesus for healing. It says, wherever he came, they laid the sick in, in, in the marketplaces that he might heal them. The world longs for Jesus, desires what he offers. Now, in this context, of course, they long for healing. Who knows how long these people have been sick or their loved ones have been sick. But really, I think beneath it all, there's a desire for the brokenness in the world to be undone. They want restoration. That was true of them back then, and it's true of us today. The world still longs for Jesus. You will never meet someone whose deepest need and ultimate desire is is not Jesus. It's not that the brokenness in their own life wouldn't be undone and restoration wouldn't come in and restore their heart, mind, body, soul. You will never meet somebody whose deepest need isn't Jesus. So here's the question I want us to wrestle with. Who are you pointing people to? We get the honor and privilege of joining Jesus empowered by the Holy Spirit in his mission on earth today. We get to point people to that compassionate love that we just saw when Jesus feeds the 5,000, where he is like a shepherd over sheep who cares for and tends to them and loves them. We get to go tell people about the God who's done that for us. So who are you pointing people to? Are you pointing them to Jesus? Or are you pointing them elsewhere? Take an honest, evaluative look in the mirror this week. Maybe even today, carve out some time. If I look at my own life, am I pointing my children? Am I pointing my spouse? Am I pointing my friends? People I have influence over in my workplace? Am I really pointing them to Jesus? Or am I pointing them to myself? Or am I pointing them elsewhere? Evaluate that today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to release to the campuses. Love you guys. Thank you so much for sticking around and and being here with us today as we look again at the ministry of Jesus in the book of Mark. And the question I just want to leave you with today is one that we've kind of wrestled with all throughout this passage. Um, As we look at Jesus who responds to our needs with great love and compassion. So the question I want you to wrestle with is, do you see the needs around you and respond with compassion? It's easy to turn a blind eye to needs, even needs in our own homes. So what needs are you not seeing? And are you responding to those with compassionate love? That splag needs, oh my, that Jesus embodied. Let's pray. 
Father God, thank you so much that you love us so much that it compelled you to, uh, to meet us in our deepest need by sending your son as a once for all sacrifice for our sins. I just pray you'd give us gracious curiosity to evaluate in our own lives where there are needs that we don't see and how you're calling us to meet those needs. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you guys for so much for joining us. Love you. Have a good Sunday.